For the first time in over two decades, the Notre Dame men's basketball program needs a new head coach. So, who's it going to be? All that and more coming up next on this edition of Locked On Irish. You are Locked On Irish, your daily podcast on the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up and welcome to Locked On Irish. It is Friday, March 10th. So happy Friday to all of you. And thank you for making this your first listen of the day. This show is free and available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. And whether you're watching or listening, please subscribe to the show. Give it a like, rate, review, all that good stuff. Uh, my name is Tyler Wojcik and I am the host. I graduated from Notre Dame in 2018. I've been podcasting about the Irish since 2020. And I'm also a producer at the Fox Sports headquarters in L.A. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. And in today's episode, I'm going to be joined by my buddy Liam Nelligan, a former walk-on basketball player at Notre Dame, to discuss some of the top candidates to replace Mike Bray as the men's basketball coach. We also get into some of the guys that we want hired, including a name that you probably haven't considered yet, but maybe you should. Um, And then we explain why whoever gets a job should be in a good position for success down the road. I thought Liam's perspective was great on this, so I hope you guys enjoy it before you get your weekend started, and uh, let's just get to it. All right, Liam Nelligan is here. I already mentioned that Liam was a walk-on basketball player at Notre Dame, but more importantly, he's an old housemate of mine and a six-time member of Club Trillion. What's going on, bro? How are you? What's up, Tyler? How are you doing, man? Thanks for having me. I'm doing well. Uh, I just realized, should we clarify what it means to be part of Club Trillion? Yeah, you wanted you wanted to find it for him. So I, I think like make sure I'm getting this right. I'm not part of the club. Yeah. So you come in for one minute and don't register a stat. So on the box score, it's one and then like twelve zeros. Is that it? I think the only correction I make is I don't think it's limited to one. You could technically have like an eight trillion, or you play Ooh, eight, eight minutes trillion. and don't register any stats. Um, oh wow! So you're much more. I, I think I, I think I think that's the definition. But okay. you'd have to go back to Titus. To- yeah, it was created by Mark Titus, and then it became a thing for all walk-ons. But So we've, we've talked about the fact that you're a walk-on, but we're forgetting the whole story leading up to that point. And I know what happened because I was around. But do you want yeah. to share your path to joining the men's basketball team? Because it's a really cool story. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so I kind of came out of high school, um, went to a, a pretty good basketball program in the state of Illinois, and then came into Notre Dame and had talked to one of the assistants, Martin Inglesby, about potentially walking on. And there was an open tryout, you know, a few weeks into the school year. Um, went through the tryout, didn't make it. They took uh, Matt Gregory, who was a, a four-year walk-on. And I actually had a chance to play with him uh, my last year. But kind of after that, um, the way it would kind of work after the season is a lot of the players would leave. So after the 2015 season, that was the team that went to the lead eight when they see championship um, like Jaron and Pat would leave. Some of the guys might be banged up and not playing. So uh, I jumped into some of the pickup runs. So I did that for a couple springs and then kind of fast forward to my senior year. Um, you know, I was doing the same thing kind of before official practice started playing pick up with the guys and it kind of parlayed itself into a more official spot where I was going to the team lifts, doing some of the, conditioning and then I think it was right after or right before the Georgia game is kind of how I remember it um the Georgia football game I kind of officially got asked to join the team and um you know played my senior year and then kind of midway through my senior year um the way the roster was shaken out there was going to be five new freshmen um and a lot of seniors leaving so one of the assistants and coach Bray had asked me if I'd be, I had any interest in staying around, sticking around. Um, and I knew I kind of, you know, worked the rest of my life. So I wanted to do the victory <laughs> lap and ended up taking a fifth year, um, and playing the, the 2018, 2019 season. You didn't even mention the bookstore championship along. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I won bookstore sophomore year. And then, um, my fifth, after my fifth year where I was, you know, borderline 24 years old playing them <laughs> against 18 year old playing bookstore. Yeah. some yeah. kids are in costumes you've played on the actual team and you're 24 yeah it wasn't a, it wasn't a great look but whatever counts I'm happy i did it 
Yeah. All right, so you played on the team for a couple of years, and you were actually at Purcell Pavilion for Bray's final home game uh, when yeah. Notre Dame was able to knock off Pitt. What was that night like? It was great. Um, it's funny. I was listening to your, your pod with, with Luke um, yesterday and how you guys were going through the, the draft of kind of the top Bray guys. And I know. You just missed it. Yeah. <laughs> you were my no, next pick. That, 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 that's not what I was going to say, but um, I kind of walked into the game late. It was just tough. to. It was a 6 p.m. game. Uh, 6 p.m. Central, so 7 p.m. Eastern. So I kind of left work, got there late, but um, was kind of sitting amongst the players, and it was a lot of the the guys that you guys had, had drafted, uh, the Kyle <laughs> McAlarneys, Troy Murphys of the world. So it was really cool to see them there and kind of the support that Coach Bray has, just I think, you know, it shows how much, like, his players care about him and how much the community respects him, because honestly there were – there's a decent student turnout, but it was, like – more just the South Bend general community that was there that, yeah. that filled up the seats and, um, you know, an awesome way to go out. I think, you know, they lost the next two games. So that'll be his last win over a ranked team um, yeah. in, in pretty cool fashion. They were up by like 18 and it got down to I like know. four or six. So we were holding <laughs> our breath, but I think an awesome way to go out. And then he had that, that, that interview on the, on the court after the game. And I think you, you took the quote about how, uh, you know, you might lose some games, but you'll never lose the party. Yeah. And that, that was kind of the, the mic drop moment. And then he rode off into into the, the linebacker that Yeah, night. into the backer. So. Yeah, you didn't make it there, though, did you? Yeah, I didn't. I, was... I, I got back on the road, but, you know, that's definitely a regret, not not making it out there. The thing is, like, he had publicized it, that he was going yeah. to the backer. So I was like, there's no chance. It's yeah. like, it should be a total It didn't look like you could even move inside. No, but honestly, it should have just won. It still would have been cool. Yeah. All right. Uh, we've talked a lot about Bray, but I think now we've got to talk about his replacement a little bit. So when you close your eyes and you picture your dream scenario, who is coaching the men's basketball program at Notre Dame and why is it Rick Pitino? <laughs> <laughs> I was actually starting to brainstorm. Until you said that. That'd be great. I saw, uh, I saw some article about how, you know, is that Iona now? And someone asked me if he'd leave Iona and he kind of gave an interesting response where, you know, usually you just rule it out. Like the Porter Moser getting asked to be Leo Oklahoma. Yeah. And I think Bettina like didn't totally rule out leaving Iona. So it'd be interesting if, you know, the Georgetown job, I don't think Notre Dame would hire a, a Rick Pitino, but um, never Could know. you imagine that though? Rick Pitino in the smoking white suit, like on the Notre Dame side. It's, <laughs> I mean, it's really difficult. I mean, it'd be hilarious. It, but like, It put people in seats. It put butts in seats. I'll oh my God. Much. No doubt. We'd have a... We'd have like a new fan base, basically. And I, I was picturing like what that opening press conference, like Father Jenkins just shaking his hand. Yeah, that's a, that that's a part a, alone that we're like, it, anything else after that, you're like, yeah, it's impossible. It's never going to happen. No, that was, I mean, we'll see. We'll be right back with Liam in a moment, but first I want to talk to you about FanDuel. The midway point of the NBA season is here and now is the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sports book, because new customers get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Then you can bet on everything from the money line to points scored and threes made. Friday nights are always a big night in the NBA, um, especially at this point in the season. Looking at the board right now, the Knicks have been scorching hot lately, and they're uh, they're underdogs tonight against the Kings. So give you the Knicks to cover the two point spread on the road in Sacramento. FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with the same game parlay. So don't miss a chance to get your no sweat first bet up to one thousand dollars in bonus bets when you go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. All right, so who's your dream candidate? I don't know. I think um, I told you this earlier. I have a, you know, I, I'd l- like to see a Porter Moser, partly because his one of his assistants is Ryan Humphrey, uh, one of the assistants when I was there, so I'd love to bring him back to South Bend. I also think he's done, I mean, he struggled a little bit at Oklahoma. Um, there's also kind of like the buyout aspect of it. I think he's like a $6 million buyout, but, you know, someone who's had, Great success in the Midwest. I don't know. Maybe a change of scenery would help. I think the, uh, it, I think a lot of people are kind of pointing to like the Shaka Smart situation where he's at Texas. You know, he actually wasn't doing terrible. I think they were like a three seed before they got found yeah. early in the tournament. But just like, you know, pressure was mounting and he decided, you know, change of scenery. And now Mark Hutt's doing um, really well. I, I honestly don't. Like, I, 
I, I wouldn't say I have like a, you know, I've got this guy in my head and he, if he doesn't become the head coach, I'm going to be very mad. So I'm, I'm interested to see how it all shakes out. I think the other names we had mentioned were like a Micah Shrewsbury from, from Penn state. He's having a good year, um, has Indiana ties. Um, Chris Holtman, who just won in the big 10 tournament, who that, that's also an interesting situation kind of has made the tournament like for the six years, the one year he didn't make it was COVID and he's probably not going to make it this year, but pressure, I guess, is mounting in, a, in Columbus where, I don't know, it seems like they have pretty uh, high expectations for the basketball program. Yeah, I would say a little bit unrealistic. The Moser thing is interesting, right? Because he publicly denied it. But then again, like, what's he going to yeah. say? Yeah, I'm super yeah, interested I don't, I don't in the Notre Dame job. Yeah, yeah I, I don't think you can put stock in like your answers while you're the head coach of a, a program. Um, you know, he, he definitely denied it, but that that's an interesting one where, you know, Oklahoma also probably has high expectations for a basketball program. And if, if he were to leave, they don't have to, because the issue is with a lot of these schools, like in Ohio state, for example, if they fire Holtman, they get to pay him like $20 million. So if, if Mosier, if they want Mosier to, to move on and it's probably easier for Notre Dame to hire him than for, for them to fire him but yeah and moser they kind of need him as they transition into the sec like the big 12 yeah. is so loaded and i think that's a big yeah. reason why oklahoma has no, this, this year so they need him to lead the way but he did preface his uh i guess denial of interest in the notre dame job by saying i'm a catholic kid from chicago like no yeah. one in the history of the world has ever said i'm a catholic kid from chicago and then i have no interest in notre dame in the same breath <laughs> <laughs> it's literally never happened. So yeah. I don't know. I don't know if I'm totally buying it. Cause I actually, I know the buyout, but his name still keeps coming up and you mentioned Humphrey too. So maybe he's trying to push him to go back. Yeah. Although he just left South Bend on yeah. his own accord. So I don't know if he's going to come back. Yeah. I know you did That's some true. South Bend bashing on, on the yeah. pod. So. <laughs> <laughs> I know I, I've toned down my, my South Bend <laughs> vitriol, I guess you could say, but I, I like Holtman. Um, yeah. I know the stock is low on him. Ohio State fans have wanted Holtman fired for months now, but I don't think I don't think Ohio State's in a position where they would do it. At least not now. Maybe if they have another really bad season, or if Holtman just chooses to leave, I think it would be yeah. Holtman's decision where he just wants a fresh start somewhere else because the relationship there is so toxic. And yeah, like his stock is down, but he was seventy and thirty-one in three seasons at Butler, and despite the real, I mean. This season has been really bad at Ohio State. Like, let's yeah. let's be honest about it. But yeah. I still think he's a top twenty coach, probably in the league. No, I, I agree. I think he's a really good coach, and I don't think Ohio State could, in their right mind, like fire him after one bad year. Um, but as you said, I don't know if you can like quantify the the fans kind of turning on someone, which it sounds like it's kind of happened. I don't follow Ohio oh, yeah. State basketball very closely, yeah. but. Um, you know, it's probably not a great situation to be in as a coach where you're, you know, people aren't going to the games or you're getting booed or whatever. But um, no, I think he's still a really good coach. I mean, they just knocked off Wisconsin. And I mean, to be fair, they almost gave it away. They're up by 20 and ended up winning by like five. But no, I, th I think I'd be okay with him. I think um, I'd be excited to have him, I'd say. And the other, the other one I'd mention is like Chris Quinn. I think the NBA to college transition would be interesting, but I mean, if there's a, I don't know if there's more like well-respected coach in the NBA, a more res well respected coach than Spolstra and being like part of the Heat. Yeah. Culture Do you think there's and any like the interest? player development. Right. Um, you know, I, I find it funny because like the cop, I think the worst part about college coaching, if I were to put myself in that shoes, is like the recruiting. I think oh, that's no doubt. Yeah. kind of brutal yeah. nowadays with NIL and like the, uh, just talking to some of my friends that have gone into it, it's like you're texting me. 17, 18 year old kids. Cause you got to stay in front of them. Um, and that's, that's a tough job, but especially in the NBA where you can kind of just, it's all basketball. Maybe there's more personalities. There's different yeah. complexities around like contracts and money. But um, I, I think there'd probably be interest there. I don't have any like inside knowledge, but um, you know, I think it'd always be attractive to come back and be the head coach at, you know, the school you, you played for. What do you think about uh, Michael Shrewsbury at Penn state? I think he's, I mean, I, I'd be happy with him. I think he's done really well at Penn State, a, a program like, I don't think they've gone to the tournament in like 10, 12 years, and they're kind of on the verge this year. Um, I think as we noted before, he's got the South Bend ties. 
think he coached IUSB, which which certainly helps. Um, they can score it, man. They have a kid who he actually went to Siena, and now he's the best. Javon Pinkett or Javon Pinkett. Um, yeah, I, I haven't watched a ton of them honestly, but you know, to be able to go into Penn State, which has you know traditionally not been a basketball power, and kind of turn it around in you know the Big Ten, which is a tough conference. Um, yeah. And that's where you, where you'd be starting, kind of with Notre Dame. Just given a honestly, they were, they were good last year, but um, you know it's going to be an uphill battle from like a roster construction standpoint. No doubt, we'll get into that. But one more thing on uh, Shrewsbury. So I had, I don't think I'd ever watched a Penn State basketball game before. Yeah. Bray decided he was going to step down, and then um, his name started popping up. So I started watching him. Those guys gun. They <laughs> like, just launch. <laughs> no, they. So I looked it up. Penn State led the Big Ten in three-point attempts this season with 858. That's 86 wow. more than the second-place team, <laughs> Illinois. But they shoot at a high percentage, too. They shot at 39%. So I'm like, look, they might not always win, but it's yeah. going to be exciting. It's interesting that, like, because I think he comes from Purdue. Like, he was an assistant yeah, at Purdue. Yeah, he did. Purdue, DePaul, and Hanover. Like, all Indiana. Yeah. No, Purdue, DePaul, Butler, I think. Yeah, all Indiana schools. Yeah, and I think when I think Purdue has kind of things like defense and Painter, you know, runs a lot of good sets, but like they always have a really good big guy and they can guard. Um, and I don't think they're shooting nine hundred threes in a season either. But um, <laughs> that's interesting. I wonder if that's more of like, you know, playing to the personnel, like he's just got a bunch of gunners, or if that's the, like the type of type of offense he he'd yeah. bring if he were to come to South Bend. But yeah, I mean, the record at Penn State hasn't been great, but it is exciting. And again, it's a school that doesn't really prioritize basketball a ton. Yeah. So those are two Power 5 coaches. that Their names have been thrown around a lot. And then uh, some mid-major names. One that's come up more recently is Matt Langle. He's out of Colgate. Uh, they've actually been a really consistently good program, especially over the last five years. They've won the Patriot League tournament three out of the past four years. But like... What do you think that transition is like for a mid-major coach to go to a Power Five school? Like, even if Notre Dame isn't, you know, a Duke or Carolina, it's still a pretty big adjustment. Yeah, no, I think so. I think it's just the recruiting battles that you get into. Like, you're recruiting against the Bucknells of the world, and you go up and, you know, in the Notre Dame, for Notre Dame, a lot of times it, it is an uphill battle if you want to get like a top sixty guy. You know, the guy you're competing against Virginia, Carolina, and Duke and the ACC, and then not to mention, you know, it's not not just teams in your conference, but you know, teams in the Big Ten, teams in the Big 12. So I think the recruiting is probably a, a big adjustment. You obviously have more ammo. Like, you've got a facility. You've got a lot more money to throw around. Um, you know, your conference kind of speaks for itself. But, you know, I think someone from a Patriot League school would probably understand the, the academic limitations. You know, Colgate's a really good school. Um, and Notre Dame, you probably aren't going to be able to get everyone. And I think why Bray was successful is he knew who he could get and got those type of guys and developed them. Um, but I, I think it's like Bray came from Delaware too. So like, I think the people have made the jump and, you know, it's kind of just like a case by case. Yeah. And whoever the next coach is, is, uh, going to have an uphill battle given the state yeah. of the <laughs> right now. I've been over this before, but Notre Dame is likely going to lose their, um, five of their top six leading scores from this past season. It could be more depending on what Starling or Lubin decide to do. Mm -hmm. And there's only one high school recruit coming in at the moment. But that being said, I still think it's a really good job, and I assume you do too. So yeah. why, do, why do you think it's still an attractive job in college basketball? Like, let's disregard the immediate future and think more long-term. Yeah. I think what Notre Dame has going for it, you know, first, something that Coach Bray worked really hard for and finally kind of got in the last couple of years was the new practice facility. Um, and I don't know if you've seen – the Rolfs basketball hall, I believe is the official title, but it's, well, I think I've been in school. Rolfs plenty when I worked, yeah. there, but I, yeah. I have not That's seen fair. the new updated facility. Yeah. I was swiping in IDs for uh, a good portion of my time as a student, but not That's in fair. the new facilities. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's a massive building. Like, it is big. Yeah. How's the entire, you know, undergrad and graduate recreation center or whatever. Um, so I think it's like the biggest by square footage and they, really done a nice job building it out with, you know, the weight room, two courts, like a video room, hot tub, cold tub, like anything you could imagine. So I think like they're on a level playing field as far as facilities. I don't think that's the most important thing, but, you know, previously when we just said the pit and then you're comparing yourselves to like what they have at Carolina, Duke, Virginia, it was a little bit tougher. Um, 
that's the first thing. I think the second thing is you're in the ACC. So like, I think that's attractive when you see a lot of these kids come in. It's like, that's a part of it. Like you get, you know, you're going to go play at Cameron. You're going to play Carolina. Um, if you do well enough in your league, you're going to make the tournament. Um, and then I'd say like the state of the ACC is an interesting, um, definitely makes it, makes it interesting too. Just given, you know, Kay is retired. Roy Williams retired. Bayham is going to retire. Um, so there's a little bit more parity. And I see, think you see that this year where, there's probably six, seven, eight teams that could win the ACC tournament, whereas before it was a lot of Duke, Carolina, Virginia. And I don't think Tony Bennett's going anywhere, so it's still going to be a lot of Virginia. But, um, you know, I think it's anyone's league, maybe <laughs> sans Virginia. Um, and I think th- there is a Notre Dame basketball brand, thanks to Coach Bray, where, like, it's an attractive place to come and go. I think whoever comes in can kind of put their stamp on it as far as style play, et cetera. But – you know, I think Notre Dame basketball like carries weight nowadays, um, and that's something you can kind of use the jump, jumping off point. Yeah, I mean the the back to back Elite Eight runs. It it was so impressive in the moment, and I think we're going to look back on it in like fifteen twenty years and realize how pivotal that was for the program and in the future of it. So, you mentioned the ACC and the changing of the guard there. Like no Coach K, no Roy Williams, no Jim Beheim, no Mike Bray. How do you think the the future of the ACC like plays a role in whoever the next coach is and what they end up doing in Notre Dame? Yeah, it, it, I think it'll be interesting. Um, with all those guys moving on, I think there have been some good young coaches stepping in, like Forbes at Wake Forest, or yeah. um, Kevin Keats has done a nice job at NC State. Um, and honestly, the guys replacing, you know, Kay and and Roy Williams have done like not Hubert Davis went to the national championship last year. Obviously, a, a down year this year. We'll see if they make the tournament, but, um, you know, it's still going to be tough. I didn't want to, you know, portray it as if like Notre Dame's just no. going to step into like a top four seed double by in, in the AC tournament, but, um, it's open. I think there's like, there's room for, you know, someone to kind of establish themselves. I think Virginia, outside of Virginia, you know, and, and you can't write off Carolina and Duke yet. Um, but we'll see. Yeah, I actually think it makes it a more attractive job because the ACC still has the status, but you're not going up against these Goliaths and Kay and Williams yeah. every year. I do, I do have – I feel like the last couple of years the ACC hasn't done as well in the preseason and the ACC Big Nine Challenge. So, like, that impacts the rest of the year as far as, you know, how many bids you get. Like, the Big Ten consistently gets 10, 11 bids. Um, and I am an ACC fan, so – I think last year they got four or five and then yeah. two of them ended no, up in yeah. the final four. So um, I, I do think there, there's a little bit more respect that should be uh, given to the ACC, but I think you're right. Like it, it makes an attractive job where, you know, no matter who's the coach of those Carolina, Duper, like everyone wants to go play at Cameron at the Dean Dome um, and being in a conference, like will definitely, uh, you know, help them on the recruiting trail. And then, ideally like if you're successful enough where you know back in like the old big east or like the current big 10 kind of it's like you're you can go eight and ten and get a bid yeah. just because it's so tough yeah it, it, it's going to be really interesting to see what notre dame chooses to do here i think we're going to get a lot more news uh in the coming weeks now that the notre dame season is over and then more teams their season is going to end yeah. in the near future but uh thanks for taking the time to come on man i really appreciate it and uh let's do this again once notre dame hires a new men's basketball coach sound good yeah, sounds good. Thanks for having me, Wedge. If you're looking for a delicious treat but don't want all the fat and calories, then you got to try a Built Bar. We're all trying to eat a little healthier but don't always want to sacrifice taste. With Built, healthy is actually tasty. Seriously, they're so delicious you won't think they're good for you. What makes Built Bar so good? Well, for starters, they're covered in 100% real chocolate. Yes, real chocolate. And come in unbelievable flavors like churro, peanut butter brownie, coconut almond, cookies and cream, and so much more. These bars taste like candy but only have 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, with a whopping 17 grams of protein. Go to BuiltBar.com and use promo code LOCKDOWN15 and you'll get 15% off your next order. And by the way, you don't need to wait around to get a box. Now you can get them at your local Walmart or Sam's Club. So head to your nearest Walmart or Sam's Club today, walk to the pharmacy section, grab yourself a box of Built Bars, and you'll thank me later. That's going to do it for me today, and that's a wrap for week two of Locked On Irish. Thanks again to Liam for coming on, and thanks to you for making this your first listen of the day. I really appreciate everyone who's been tuning in during the first couple weeks of the show. I'm pleased with how it's gone so far, but... 
We're not even scratching the surface yet, folks. So I'm even more excited about the future of this show and to follow along. Remember to subscribe to the show on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to give us a follow on Twitter at Lockdown Irish, on Instagram at Lockdown Irish Pod, and my personal Twitter account at Tyler W O J C I A K. For your second listen today, check out Lockdown College Basketball. Experts Isaac Shade and Andy Patton bring you everything you need to know on and off the court. Plus, hear from big name experts, coaches, and players throughout the basketball landscape. That That's Locked On College Basketball, available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Enjoy your weekend, everybody. I'll see you guys on Monday.